to have been a massive fan of the BBC science fiction serial Doctor Who. I could talk for hours about this show, and indeed, whenever there's a subject close to my heart that I believe I can talk for hours on, my recourse is often the same, to make a series of videos on the subject. My intention with this new series is to highlight some of the stories from the classic era of the show, the classic era being the initial 26 year run from 1963 through to its cancellation in 1989, before what has subsequently come to be known as the modern era following the show's resurrection in 2005 and its continuation to this day. So, this being the first video, I thought I'd take a look at one of my favourite stories, a seven-part John Pertwee serial, Inferno, from 1970. The story opens with the Doctor, having recently been exiled to Earth, driving his Edwardian roadster Bessie to an undisclosed location. Meanwhile, a milkman making his rounds stops off at Project Inferno, a mining operation with the objective to penetrate the Earth's crust so as to harness the energy within. Once there, he comes into contact with some green slime. He wanders out in a trance-like state and proceeds to attack an innocent bystander. The Doctor arrives at his makeshift laboratory, located on the Project Inferno site. Being the Doctor's laboratory, it of course comes with some state-of-the-art future tech, such as the TARDIS console, an electric sliding door, and the obligatory dodgy 70s chroma key effect. His assistant Liz comes to greet him. A move away from the traditional companions of the past, she's a Cambridge-educated scientist, and much more of an intellectual equal to the Doctor. As a result of this, of course, the character only lasted for one series. Despite her being a greater feminist take on the traditional assistant role, she still wasn't above a little early 70s sexist patronising. Look, Liz. Look, without the TARDIS, I feel rather lost. Stranger in a foreign land. Shipwrecked mariner. When do you want to make this trial run? An inappropriate personal space invasion on the part of Pertwee. As this iteration of the Doctor is stranded on Earth, he attempts, with Liz's help, to mend his console. However, because of the antics of the rapidly mutating Slocum wreaking havoc in the base, a sudden energy surge results in the Doctor being momentarily sucked into a different dimension. This episode was broadcast a mere nine months after Woodstock, and by the look of this, the Doctor could well have got his hands on the bad acid that was doing the rounds there. He's called to the base where Slocum is running wild and starting to betray an eerie resemblance to a slightly hairy George Romero zombie. He attempts to attack the Doctor, but is taken down by a unit soldier. The Doctor then receives word that the soldier has gone missing. Up on the plant-based roof, he discovers him looking a little green around the gills. <laughs> The Doctor is shown a canister of radioactive phlegm that's been emanating from a pipeline. He voices his concerns, but they just don't want to listen. They're too busy asking if they could, and they never stop to think if they should. Yes, well, I'll tell you something that should be of vital interest to you, Professor. But what? That you, sir, are a nitwit. You tell him, Doctor. Once again, he resorts to Liz for assistance in the only way an early 70s male in his 50s can. Liz... Go and check the trigamma circuits on the console again. Do you want me to do that? No, please. Don't ask any questions. It's a good guy. Right. Ooh, possessing the Y chromosome can make you wince sometimes. The Doctor discovers Professor Stallman attempting to destroy a vital microcircuit and delivers him a side order of Venusian karate on his ass. What else do you think you're doing? Venusian karate. It's very effective. Hold it long enough. And the subject remains permanently paralysed. You don't want to mess with this bad boy. The Doctor and Liz return to the makeshift laboratory. Wow, they're really proud of their sci-fi tech here, aren't they? Thank you. Liz returns to the research centre. Whilst there, the base experiences a sudden power surge that appears to be emanating from the Doctor's laboratory. Liz gets back to the lab, just in time to witness the Doctor vanishing. He wakes up in seemingly the exact same location. However, his hut now has an ominous-looking poster adorning the wall. Unity, strength. Okay, so it's a parallel universe, an England that's now under fascist control. Got it. 
So something here is amiss. His sonic screwdriver is no longer able to operate something as technologically advanced as an electric door. As he leaves the lab, he is instantly fired at by two members of units, and a chase ensues. As much as I love the John Pertwee era, the decision to turn the Doctor into a man of action, apparently as a result of a suggestion by Pertwee himself, never really worked for me. It was arguably understandable at the time, because the series had to compete with shows like Danger Man and The Saint. The thing is, Pertwee was in his early 50s at the time, and would look ever so faintly ridiculous when plunged into the middle of these stunt-heavy action scenes, especially whilst wearing his Edwardian garb. Oh, grow up, man. He takes refuge on top of one of the cooling towers. Unfortunately, up here waiting for him is another George Romero reject. Luckily for the Doctor, the rooftop to most scientific test sites seem to have fire extinguishers installed. Liz? Liz, it's me. Don't you recognise me? No, it's a parallel England under fascist rule. Got it. This dimension is obviously one of those with a far greater proliferation of brown hair dye. The Doctor is taken away by Benton and the other unit soldiers to the interrogation office. And here we come to arguably the most entertaining aspect of the serial, the alternate Lethbridge Stewart. Every now and again, Who became greater than the sum of its parts and produced moments that were so good, it was almost a shame they were hidden away in what was considered by many to be merely a silly science fiction show for kids. This is one such moment. Nicholas Courtney's performance as the brigade leader, as opposed to the brigadier, is absolutely mesmerising. A true testament to what a superb actor he was. It's a truly sinister turn he gives here. He looks like the Lethbridge Stewart of our dimension, but obviously is not, and this is portrayed with only a few affectations and subtle touches. The eye patch, the scar down the face, the way he nonchalantly leans back in the chair and slowly delivers his dialogue in a calm manner is really unsettling. Um, might I suggest you just call me Doctor? Doctor? Doctor what? Smith. Dr. John Smith. Smith. Yes, of course. And where do you come from, Dr. Smith? Courtney has often cited this story as his personal favourite because of the chance he got to play this alternate character and show off some of his range. A really good dramatic turn on his part. Well, now, wait a minute. Yes, I think I'm beginning to see what's happened here. I come from a parallel space-time continuum. Finally, Doctor. The Doctor is introduced to the alternate Professor Stallman, now Sam's beard. Unfortunately, this Professor Stallman looks in a bad way, like a kind of swore-figured up Robin Williams. May I ask what is going to happen to me? You'll be shot, eventually. Ooh, God, he's so good in this. The matter-of-fact way he delivers these lines. But I don't exist in your world! Then you won't feel the bullets when we shoot you. The Doctor performs Venusian Karate on Benton. Oh, have you ever seen anything like this before? You know what? That shit actually works. Try it! The Doctor escapes, but is quickly reapprehended. He attempts to explain to Section Leader Shaw where he comes from, and is then interrogated. Stallman breaks up the interrogation, and the Doctor asks to see his hand. Well, they say a madman should be humoured. Bandages, eh? How convenient. The Doctor is placed in a holding cell. The person in the neighbouring cell just happens to be one of those people that likes to sleep with a blanket covering them entirely from head to toe. The Doctor is awoken by an ominous noise. Hey, we've all woken up the next morning and wondered what the thing we've been lying next to all night was. Yep, that's pretty much par for the course with me as well even down to the prison cell setting. Not even flexible plastic bars can hold this beastie back. Thankfully for the Doctor though, he does appear to suffer from an extreme aversion to mattresses. The Doctor escapes, finds a radiation suit, and makes his way back into the operation room. 
However, the brigade leader recognizes him. If you break through the Earth's crust now, your release forces you never dreamed could exist! Note that throughout this serial, the sound of the bore drill plays as an ominous background noise, but gets increasingly louder and louder as the story progresses. This was a great way of building up tension. It feels far more atmospheric than many other Who stories. There's a sort of ticking clock element to this one. The louder the drill gets, the closer we the viewer feel we're getting to some sort of dramatic payoff. The way it ratchets up the tension over its episodic run makes this a unique Who story, more thriller than straight up science fiction. An explosion rocks the centre of operations. The Doctor puts his radiation suit back on and we get some more of that 50 plus action. I believe the choreographer here would later go on to work on the Duel of Fate sequence in The Phantom Menace. Compared to the forces that you people have unleashed, an atomic blast would be like a summer breeze. And now you'll note that the ever-increasing sound of the bore drill has been replaced by volcanic eruptions. The flashing red danger lights have come on. There's now a dousing of perspiration on all the actors. The jackets have come off, the ties have been loosened, the sleeves have been rolled up, all to up the high-octane stakes some more. Incidentally, a scene was recorded and then deleted from episode 5, featuring the Doctor, section leader Shaw and the brigade leader listening to a radio broadcast. The radio announcer was voiced by John Pertwee. Producer Barry Letts felt that his voice was too recognisable to viewers and the scene was edited out prior to transmission. There can be no doubt that the wave of earth tremors and quakes are in some way connected with the penetration of the Earth's outer crust. I don't know, I think I would have been fooled. The heat and the pressure shall continue to build up until the Earth dissolves in a fury of expanding gases, just as it was millions of years ago. How long have we got? Maybe a few weeks, maybe only a few days. So it's doomsday! The Romero reject from the earlier cell scene appears and is fired on by the brigade leader. Incidentally, notice how every time he shoots, lines appear on the image. This was because the loud bang of the prop gun going off would vibrate the valves in these early 70s BBC cameras and create this odd effect. The Doctor takes down the prisoner with a fire extinguisher. It wasn't just your bullets that killed him, you know. The fire extinguisher? Yes, the fire extinguisher. You can't stand cold. You see, there's logic to it all. It's not just some silly way to take down this week's monster. It's marvellous, isn't it? The world's going up in flames and they're still playing at toy soldiers! We're just going to die in here. I can't take it in. Look, I'm sorry, but there are times when it's better to face the truth. Oh, Greg, I'm frightened. And as the tension ratchets up, you also get a foreboding sense of nihilism, largely absent from a lot of other Who stories. This is the one where they actually can blow the world up at the end. Okay, Russell T. Davis blew up the world every week, but in original Who, this never happened. The Doctor always had to save the day in the end. Not so here. This ends with the Earth falling prey to a global volcanic eruption. But hey, it was a world inhabited entirely by Nazis, so that makes it okay, right? The Doctor attempts to demonstrate to Liz and the Brigade Leader that the TARDIS console is an operational mode of travel. They are, of course, wowed by the technical sophistication of such a device, in particular the way it wobbles in the middle. Petra the physicist frees Professor Stallman from his confines, only to reveal that thanks to the heat, himself and everyone else trapped within have been transformed into blue wolfmen. Funny, I thought extreme temperature conditions merely caused severe damage to the skin and flesh, but no, blue wolfmen, who knew? Incidentally, the Wolfman design was Director Douglas Canfield's idea. The initial plans was for the victims of the core heat to be transformed into a more Neanderthal-like state, and I have to say I think this would have worked a lot better. It's not a bad design for a Doctor Who monster of the era, but it does feel a little out of place. When everything else in the story has had much more of a grounding in scientific theory, even the parallel universe stuff, to have this 11th hour gothic element introduced just feels at odds with the tone of the rest of the story. That's Stallman. Andy, he has that massive name tag on. It's almost as if someone was worried you wouldn't recognise the character from before under all that makeup. 
Ooh, look at these things. Never work with animals. They have a tendency to stare directly down the lens of the camera. Starman attacks our heroes, but is defeated by the administration of a deadly, light smattering of cool air to the genitals. Liz and the brigade leader emerge into the blistering heat of the outside world. Wow, now that's some saturation to the film stock. It is hot out here. I still find it impossible to breathe. Well, you did insist on holidaying in Australia this year, dear. Oh, too soon. One of the scientists emerges into the outdoor heat in the final stage Wolfman makeup. Stalman attacks the brigade leader, but he shoots him down dead. Death by wobble cap. He then escapes outside along with Liz and Petra, and they periodically lose their footing due to the camera operator on the day clearly suffering from Parkinson's. They retreat to the lab. An argument breaks out, resulting in the brigade leader attempting to shoot Greg. More middle-aged fight choreography ensues. <laughs> Greg returns for Petra, who is busy trying to fix the relay circuits. Jesus, doesn't this guy ever stay down? I thought it was only cats that had nine lives. I'd have thought he'd be less resilient considering you can take him down with a shot of cold air to the knob. Who said the BBC had poor health and safety standards in the 70s? You can almost hear the floor manager shouting, For God's sake, mind his face! Thanks to the efforts of Petra, the doctor gets his console working. The brigade leader holds him at gunpoint and demands that he takes them with him. The Doctor can't because rifts in the temporal spectrum, yada yada yada. When the Brigade Leader attempts to kill the Doctor, Section Leader Shaw shoots him in the back. Now's your chance, Doctor! Outside, the world is gradually destroyed by grainy stock footage. Go on, Doctor, go now! As the Doctor dematerializes, the remaining characters face their imminent deaths by Raspberry Jam. If there ever was a bleaker denouement to a Who story, I haven't seen it. The Doctor wakes up back in our dimension and is discovered by Liz. Hearts beating steadily? Both of them? Yes. <laughs> He's an alien. The Doctor wakes. Doctor, you really ought to rest. You, you've been unconscious. That's why I'm helping you up. The Doctor attempts to foil the penetration of the Earth's crust. Stop this bullet! You wouldn't listen to me! You all think I'm mad! However, as he has been led away... Well, I'm sorry about this, gentlemen. Oh. Foiled by pinching. Whoever said playground tactics couldn't best two highly trained military personnel. Meanwhile, our world's Professor Stallman is confused by a seeming outbreak of mild green fairy liquid. Wow, that was some quick wolfing out. Didn't that take like four episodes in the other universe? And again he attacks. Not too many shots, Brigadier. You know it plays merry hell with a camera image. That's it. Stick to the tried and tested method. Death by Chilly Willy. Stallman has sabotaged the controls, leaving the Doctor very little time to repair them. But of course he does. Just in time to stop the drill before it penetrates the Earth's crust. Well done, Doctor. The Doctor then attempts to leave with his newly restored TARDIS console. Goodbye, Liz. I shall miss you, my dear. And I've had about all I can stand of this pompous, self-opinionated idiot here. Now see what you've done. Well, I didn't know he'd go off like that. The man's so infernally touchy. <clears throat> Welcome back. Where did you go? A few seconds forward in time and a few hundred yards due east in space. The rubbish tip? The rubbish tip. Pompous, self-opinionated idiot, I believe you said, Doctor? Yes, well, we, we don't want to bear a grudge for a few hasty words, do we? So, Doctor. So, there we have Inferno. This could very well be my favourite of the classic era serials, maybe my favourite of all time. 
I don't want to categorically say it is because they made so many and there are so many good ones but this one is top five for me easily. The John Pertwee era was really the point where the show started to experiment with gearing it towards a more adult audience, an audience that had grown up with the show throughout the 60s. It wasn't solely for children anymore by this point. The storylines of this era certainly display some of the most mature writing the series ever achieved. In later years, the series would come to strike a much finer balance when it came to appealing to both adult and child alike, making it quintessential Saturday night family entertainment. However, I really dig the sophistication of the John Pertwee era, especially here in the first year of his tenure. The storylines have a meatiness to them. It feels less like disposable television, and Inferno is the finest example of this. Economically written, very well executed, with very little flab on it, despite its seven episode run. Imaginative science fiction that's able to touch on some deep, heady themes. It's maybe not considered one of the absolute best by most fans, but it's certainly a favourite of mine. That's 1970s Inferno. Anyway, thanks for joining me for this one folks. If you liked it, I may do some more of these. Doctor Who is something I never tire of talking about. So until next time, this is me Big Buddha signing off and I shall see you all out there in YouTube land. Nothing like a nice happy ending, is there?